You know, New York, I'm going down. Well, we're muted, but. No, you're not. Hello? You're not muted. No? Oh. I thought we were. <laughs> no, loud and clear. It says I'm muted. Well, it lies.
Welcome to the Northwest Theater Workshop Showcase. CG?
It's true, but I'm I'm hooked up to the right place, and I and I wrote a little. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I was told not to mute myself. Do you want me to?
to Northwest Theater Workshop's 2021 Annual Showcase. I'm CG, your host, and tonight we will be featuring the first 20 minutes of three full-length plays. But uh, more about that in a minute. First, I would like to share with you how to maximize your Zoom experience here with us tonight. First, we do invite you to have your sound on and unmuted so we can have hear your laughter and your applause. But we ask you to turn it down your volume to 20% if you have it on. We also will leave the chat on during the entire show so that you can share your comments and laughter and applause through the chat as well. Um, now about these three plays you are about to see the first 20 minutes of. These three plays have just finished our CREATE program here at Northwest Theater Workshop. And our CREATE program, in our CREATE program, playwrights take part in a series of workshops, investigations, and discussions that are focused on developing the story they want to tell. And it's then, and only then, after the full development of character, story, thematic material, all that yum yum we love in a story, that we start moving forward with the playwright on working on their actual script. And that's where we are with these playwrights. They are just starting to work on their scripts. Next season, they will take part in our develop program, where we will explore how each of the scripts work as an acted and directed text and theatrical experience. So be sure to check back with us because part of that development process includes public presentations of the full work that hopefully you'll be so excited to see after tonight, you won't, you won't be able to stop yourself from coming back. You can learn more about us at our website, nwtw.org. There you'll find information about the company, who we are, what we do, and the programs we offer. We have a number of free workshops and other kinds of programming for audiences and playwrights alike. We, um, you can also make a donation there on our website and find the show program. The um, all donations tonight are divided amongst equally amongst the artists and technicians bringing you this show tonight. So if you enjoy their work and want to show some appreciation to them, that's a great way to do it. You can also stick around after the show where we will talk briefly with these playwrights. You can ask them questions about their work, their process, and give them a little um, two cents about what you thought about what you saw tonight so far. Um, and with that, with no further ado, I present to you Northwest Theater Workshops 2021 Annual Showcase. Miho by Jonathan Hernandez. Act one, scene one, setting, 
Christmas Eve, Diana's place. A three-bedroom house designed like a model home. Everything is spotless and in its perfect place. The living room is an open floor plan with furniture that's never been sat on. The carpet is fresh as if no one ever steps foot there. And the house is as cold as a museum. Morning, Henry, 20 years old, lays in the living room with a pencil over his ear. His art supplies are scattered about as he makes the final touches on a batter that says, welcome home, brother. Henry checks the hallway to see if someone's coming. Stop it, Henry. You're working yourself up again. It'll happen when it happens. Just focus on the banner. Yeah, you're right, Henry. I mean, look at this. It's your best work yet. Mom was probably calling me right now. Ring, ring. Hi, is this Henry? Uh, yes, it is. Oh my God, Henry, we really love what you've done with your work. Why, thank you. We'd love to hear all about how you were inspired to create something so beautiful for your brother. Well, you see, it all started. Albert, 50 years old, wearing a faded 2001 Diamondbacks World Series shirt, enters from the hallway with a drink in one hand and his cane in the other. Albert's short with a strong build, has wide shoulders, and is slightly hunched over from the years of abusing his body playing baseball. He's cocky yet charismatic. Ladies and gentlemen, introducing famous baseball legend Alberto Martinez! <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> wow. Check this out. Mmm, <laughs> there's one thing missing. What's that? Me? I'm not in it. Albert quickly slides Henry's pencil out from his hands and pretends to be an artist. I'll draw myself in, huh? Yeah, just kidding, huh? You can draw me in, huh? Uh, like this, huh? Get my good side, eh? That's my left. You know how I know that? You bat right handed. I bat right handed, orale, huh? When I'm at the plate, the fans would get to see my left side, see? Huh? Wow. Uh, <laughs> a baseball card in the making, Dad. I keep telling you I'm famous, but you don't believe me, huh? Man, what a mess, Mio. Your mother's not gonna like this, huh? Uh, hey, Dad, uh, I made some coffee. You want some? Oh, I'm good, huh? Got something strong right here. <laughs> see that. It's a little early, don't you think? This? It's just Coke. <laughs> Why are you doing this? I mean, it's all nonsense, if you ask me. Remember when we go watch you play baseball in those tournaments? Back in the day? Yeah, that was the dream. My brother and I would stay up all night making signs, calling you the OG. Yeah, I like the bat breaker sign, huh? Everyone loved that. <laughs> We'd all gather around chanting your name, showing our support, right? <laughs> I crushed it out there, didn't I? The guys never knew this old man could hit. Huh? I'm doing this to cheer my brother on. Oh. I mean, I remember this one time, being at the batting cages, I knew the owner, so I'd get in for free. And man, I was hitting them suckers hard, too, boy. You could hear the sound of that ball, you know, pop right off that bat. If the GMs were there, man, they'd say, get this man a uniform right now! <laughs> it's, it's pretty cool, Dad. <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> I had dreams, mijo. Huh? I could have been a star. You know, right out of high school, straight into the majors. I know what it takes to perform at that level. Not your brother, though. He, he just wasn't cut out for, for the dream. Huh? And yet here you are making this chiste banner. It's not chiste, it's dope. It's not like he did anything to deserve this. It's what families do. Hey, you want some breakfast? Let me make you something. You think I'm buzzed? Come on, I'll make you some eggs. You trying to butter me up for something? I got your note you left on my door. Come on, Henry. Be a man, don't. Go tiptoeing around the subject. I wanted to talk to you about Christmas tomorrow. Spit it out. 
Yesterday you were complaining about mom and how it's cold. This is what you wanted to talk to me about. I got an idea though. You could stay in my room. It's warmer and it's... So for Christmas, you want me to give you a gift by staying in your room. If you're worried about moving your stuff, I'll do it for you. It's no problem. I'll do it right now. Back up. Back up. You waited until now to come and talk to me about this? Dad, Anthony's coming home today. What's that got to do with me? He could have his room back, and I can be in there with him like old times. <laughs> old times. <laughs> Keep dreaming. <laughs> What's that supposed to mean? Must be nice coming home to something like this, huh? Especially after, you know, spending five years in the pen. You know I talk to my brother every week. We're no different. What else you got planned, hmm? A parade? A marching band? You two gonna sit around and watch your Bruce Lee movies together? Come on, Dad. Don't be like that. What? Well, come on, Dad. Don't be a baby, huh? I'm not being a baby. Stop thinking like one, huh? Why are you celebrating this criminal's return, huh? Anthony's no hero in this family. He is to me. Please, Dad, help me give him a second chance. We are giving him a second chance. He's living here and not out on the street, right? I just want my brother to recover and make it through his probation. It's not right. Then take it up with your mother, huh? She doesn't trust him either. She doesn't know who's going to walk through that door any more than you do. She said that? She didn't say that. You calling me a liar? Man. I'm done with you, mama's boy. I'm going back to my room, huh? <laughs> I'm going back to my room, eh? Man, shut up. Always trying to step up on me because you're bigger? You're lucky I don't go Bruce Lee on your ass. <laughs> Man, I'm telling mom. Henry heads to Diana's room, but pauses and decides to make her a cup of coffee. Act one, scene two, Diana's bedroom. Diana's room is spacious, clean, and organized in its rightful place. The nightstand is occupied with a Bible, pain reliever ointments, and a pile of unpaid bills. The room has a faint perfume of an apple spray found at Bath and Body Works. Henry enters, holding a cup of coffee, Diana, 55 years old, stands in front of the mirror, fixing her hair. Morning, Mom. I brought you coffee. Oh, mm, it's right on time. I can always count on you to bring me my cafe. Mm. I should say I brought you a little coffee with your cream. Well, that's how I like it. Lots of cream. I want the coffee to match my skin tone. <laughs> mm. oh, it's so good. I needed this. I've been up all night. <sighs> you didn't make a mess, a mess fixing this up, right? Because I, I don't have time to clean up a mess right now. I have been up all night. No mess, I swear. Uh, hey, Ma, I, I wanted to talk to you about my brother. Well, aren't you going to ask me why I have been up all night? Why were you up all night? My back is hurting. I'm worried that it's going to go out again. Oh. Drinking enough water? What does that have to do with anything? Your doctors keep telling you to drink more water when taking your medication. I drink enough water. Okay, hand me my water. Hmm. Hmm. Thanks, Nico. You're just such a good boy. <laughs> hey, uh, where's Anthony sleeping? Oh, that reminds me. Um, go grab the blankets and put them in the living room. So you are putting him in there. I, I spoke to your father about it, and, and he thinks that that is best. Why didn't you talk to me about it? I, poor baby. Are you mad I didn't come talk to you first? <laughs> Dad's the guest in this house. He should be out there, and my brother should have his room back. Don't be ridiculous. I'm not putting Alberto in the living room. Ugh, I don't want to see ugly when I have to go to work. <laughs> then he should leave. He is your father, Henry. 
I cannot kick him out to the streets. He will get himself killed. What if the cops arrest him? We already have a felon in this house. We don't need another one. Then he can go back to my tia's. It's too late for that right now. Anthony can handle being in the living room right for now. When will he get his room back? You ask too many questions. You are giving me a headache. He needs us right now. Don't you want to help him? Why? Why should I go above and beyond for him right now? He is a liar. He lied to me when I confronted him about skipping school. He lied to me about the drugs, at the jobs, everything that he would get and all of it. No, so no, I am not going to let him off the hook until I say that it's fine. It was a long time ago. He's changed. He's lucky I don't handcuff him to my wrist until his probation is over. What about the alcohol? But you know that Alfred is in pain. He just got out of the hospital. Like a month ago. What do you want me to do about it? Anthony told huh? us he can't be around that while he's in recovery. It's a drug charge. That is not true. You, you need to check your memory. <sighs> Having alcohol is fine. They're going to inspect the house. Alberto will take care of it. <laughs> What's he going to do with it? I am, I, I, I'm not worried about your father. Eh? I already know what to expect from oh, him. You hmm. always give him a free pass. I am doing everything that I can to keep this house in order. I have you, him, and now another mouth to feed, which means that I need to take on more hours at my job because none of you pay a dime in my house. And, and I don't appreciate the way that you're talking to me right now. You are starting to sound like your brother, who already makes me nervous. Mom. Mm. I'm sorry for arguing. Mama. It's fine. Mama. Forget it. It's not like you care anyway. Oh Just go get ready. I ironed an outfit for you. It's over there. I told you to stop doing this. Well, I thought that's what you wanted to wear. <laughs> you mean it's what you want me to wear? What is the difference? I'm not wearing this. I cannot having I cannot have you looking all shady with your hoodie at the prison. You don't want to give the guards any reason, Henry. You have to look sharp. You have to look non-threatening. And to make sure that you shave that thing off your face. Then maybe I shouldn't go. We don't want them thinking of we're all a bunch of criminals. No, 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 no. You, you need to come with me. We're getting food after. Mom, I think you and Anthony need some time alone to talk. I'll just stay here and wait until you get back. I don't like that idea. I, I will need help with directions. You mm. know where it's at. I need you to put gas. I already put gas. Well, what about the way back? Why can't you do this by yourself? Because it is not a good idea to have your mother go into a prison by herself to pick him up. He's not a stranger. He's your son, mom. Last time I saw him, he, he didn't look like himself. He is big. He is scary and uh, dirty. That's just from prison. He's not like that. You know it. Fine. If you're not going to come with me, then uh, uh, I'll need you to go clean. Uh, because I'm not going with you? I have decided that everyone needs to start helping me around here, especially if they're going to be acting like this. Mom. I am done talking about this, Henry. Now, uh, go clean the bathroom. Ugh. You should be thankful that I'm allowing you to put that thing up in my living room. And Henry, oh, you better not mess up my walls. <sighs> Henry exits. Diana finishes getting dressed. Act one, scene three. Henry's bedroom looks nothing like the rest of the house. It's colorful, imaginative, and disorganized. Henry enters with a box labeled Anthony's room. He places it down by the door and vents to a Bruce Lee poster pinned on his wall. Help me, Bruce. Henry, I am leaving. Oh. Diana tries to enter without knocking, but a box keeps the door closed. What the hell? Jesus, Mom. Boundaries. Why is the door stuck? Look at your room. 
It's a mess. Stop pushing. There's a box right here. I'm cleaning it now. Well, don't forget to do the bathroom. Hmm? I did, Mom. It doesn't look like it. I did clean it, Bruce. <laughs> She's always doing this shit to me. Drives me crazy. Sorry for all the cussing. I don't know why my mom's being this way. It's like she's forgotten about all the happy moments. The times we went on vacation, went to the movies, going shopping. She loves going shopping with brother. And when did my parents ever agree on anything? All they ever do is fight. But Anthony, he wouldn't put up with those two. He'd walk in and set them straight. Oh, they'd still yell just at him, but he didn't care. He was the man of the house, bold, courageous, strong. When he left, it wasn't the same. I, mean, I tried to be that guy, but I couldn't. This one time, when my mom and dad were fighting, it was the worst. Dad was drunk already. My mom was yelling. I remember the walls rattling as the noise bounced back and forth. I stayed in my room when that happened. I'd lay in my bed and pray that my brother would come in like a badass and save me, save us all. Protect my mom from my dad. Protect my dad from himself. And something came over me. I, I just finished watching Fist of Fury. You remember that? I mean, of course you do. Anyway, my, my fear turned into anger and I felt like I could fix this. I said to myself, what would Bruce Lee do? <laughs> I hear my dad say, you don't want me here? Fine, I'm leaving. I jump up and run to the living room, grabbing his keys off the counter. I stare him down for the first time ever. He says, Hand him over. You want him? Come get him. <laughs> He's chasing me through the house, yelling at me. I tell him he's stupid to think he can drive drunk. We make our way to the backyard. I slam the keys into the pool. Come on, Dad. Time for a swim. He stands at the edge, watching them sink to the bottom. He looks at me, spits on the ground, and then walks away. It was over. I won, but he didn't go back into his room. He didn't go to sleep it off like he normally does. He heads to the washroom instead and gets the spare. I tried to tell him he can't leave because God knows what will happen to him. Cops could take him in, but what if he hurts someone out there? He has to stay here. It's safer, but he doesn't get that. I wanted to get between him and the door, but he pulled me out of the way like I was nothing. I tried to pull on his arm like like trying to move it but it's like trying to move a sofa by yourself i i begged and cried and i fought so hard but he didn't budge i didn't have the strength anymore he called me weak and that i'll always be the baby of the family and i got so mad i grabbed his head and slammed it into the door <sighs> my mom screamed and we finally stopped and he ends up leaving and i end up in the backyard fishing out the keys by myself you know, if my brother was here None of that would have happened. I, I know, once we're all together, all of us in the living room together, talking and joking and laughing, even if it's just for one night, it's all going to work out. It has to. End of scene. Binders by Brad Bolchunos. Setting. Primary action occurs in laboratory at the Physico-Technical Institute, Petrograd, Russia, October 25th, 1920 at approximately 9 a.m. Scene 1. At Rise, a physics lab near Petrograd, October 1920. A red rug is tacked across the entry. The walls are mounted with a loudspeaker, a clock, and pneumatic tubes labeled incoming and outgoing. Gizmos and books deck the room. Theremin, unshaven having worked through the night, glances at the clock as he listens to a proximity alarm, a contraption using headphones. The loudspeaker squeals. He removes one earpiece to half listen. 
Welcome, comrades, to another day of productivity. This is Superintendent Korsunsky with a daily statement from the Commissar of Communication. The new order continues to deliver peace across our great nation with its efficient system of rules for all people. A buzzer and a flashing light signify a form has arrived in the incoming tube. Theremin dashes to it, removes the canister, and unfurls the paper from inside. He types a word on the form, initials it, stuffs it in a canister for the outgoing tube, and cranks a pump, sending the completed form with a thump sound. The war is long over. Contrary to despicable falsehoods, there are no pockets of resistance, and dutiful citizens should report anyone claiming otherwise. Good day. Distant war sounds can still be heard. Theremin puts on the headphones to resume work on the proximity alarm. Iafi bursts into the lab. It's amazing. I, I can't wait to... Theremin cannot hear him. In excitement, Iafi reaches out to touch him to get his attention, but catches himself and stops. Uh, Lev, listen! An idea unfolding! He slides absurdly into Theremin's view and waves exaggeratedly. Uh, so much potential! Professor. You know, you don't have to use my title anymore. I know. Uh, Yafi. Old habit. Uh, you're on to something. Yes. An observation. A discovery, maybe. I, in my research. I... Who do you think... <laughs> I am possible to tell who fired that one. I doubt there'll be any more bombing today. How can you tell? I can't, but, but it's reasonable based on what we hear. When my headphones shut out those sounds, I'm glad. <sighs> yes. Is that odd of me to admit? No, uh, but you probably would have heard that blast anyway. How are you so unfazed? <laughs> would you consider this unfazed? Uh, we're fortunate to be here at the Institute. It's relatively safe. There are no pockets of resistance. <laughs> Shh. Isn't that grounds for... You can't report me. I'm not claiming otherwise. Lev, research, a fascinating new turn. I, I, I want to tell you about it. The tube buzzer. I, I beg your pardon, Yafi, but please, first. Can you tell me how you managed to get any work done? I have to complete all of these forms immediately because I asked for a deadline extension on the Proximity Alarm project. Uh, th think of the forms as a, a sequence of small steps, uh, like your project, uh, or a mathematical proof. As soon as I sent the request, another arrived to have me make it official uh, by, si by submitting the formal form. <laughs> it's a formality abnormality. <laughs> I've got 14 minutes left on the original deadline in this latest form. Uh, estimate of the extent of extension is asking how much time I need. Don't let it consume you. I'm sorry. Uh, you, the work, the discoveries. Together, they mean more to me than I can say. Please, continue. Colleague and I were reviewing the research you and I did. The different levels of electromagnetism evident in radiation near the radio towers you operated in the war. The clinical data. Yes, the effects. How you and other soldiers and citizens near those towers experienced headaches, fatigue, prickling skin, and other issues. We considered patients at the Medical Institute as well, who are suffering similar nervous system disorders. Isn't that a lot of that medical information filtered? Uh, our 
colleague is affiliated with the Medical Institute and had insights today that got me thinking. Thus far, what do you and I view as the cause? Prolonged exposure to waves of electromagnetic radiation. Right, but we studied the waves only at a large scale. Isn't that logical? Those radio towers are enormous. What if we compared the behavior of those towers and those waves to the microelectromagnetic discharges of the human body? That's quite a difference in scale. Vast. What do you think that comparison might reveal? A pattern. You always say a pattern is a hint from nature that we are beginning to understand. Yes, that's what I'm excited about. Now help me think this through. I need that amazing mind of yours. We know at the massive level of the towers, the waves spike in frequency before they dissipate. And do you wonder about microelectromagnetic discharges? Hypothesis. If we account for the difference in scale, the waves will show the same behavior. They will act the same way. Admit it. Intriguing, yes? Absolutely. Tell me, where we would start such an investigation? We would ex start by examining the parallels more closely. Yes. I need you in this work. My top student before the war. My top electromagnetism physicist at the Institute. That's a good thing you're here. Affidavit that extension was unavoidable. To be countersigned by supervisor. You're fixating on these forms again. I wouldn't need these series of forms if I could have solved the issue I'm having with the proximity alarm. Actually, there may be a correlation. The problem involves electromagnetic discharges. Show me. Uh, well, I was measuring the prototype's uh, electromagnetic field when I discovered my own body seems to create interference. Theremin unplugs the headphones and demonstrates by moving his arm slightly. Yafi cranes his head. That crackling sound? Yes, you hear it. Oh, I thought I was going mad. It's faint, but you can hear the slightest changes in my position. They listen. Both sway. Iafi accidentally steps too close and nearly touches Theremin, who recoils a bit. Iafi sees his mistake and retreats a step. The sound fades. The crackle reminds me of what I heard at the radio towers. Others heard it too. Not just the predicted frequency drifts. On all sorts of equipment. Uh, tiny storms of sound. Something about that sound, it, eerie, it, it reminds me of that weird music employed by a certain 18th century doctor, which is amazing because that same doctor surfaced in my conversation with our colleague earlier today. And use of, you know what, to heal people. Shh. You even studied him before the war. It's against the codes of conduct to even allude to the doctor from Vienna. Look, I know it's dangerous to even speak of someone like the doctor from Vienna in these times. But no, no thanks to Rasputin. Any association, it's all about the, the trickery, the treachery, the manipulation of the royal family. The stoking the fires for the revolution, the that war. The latest work of our colleagues suggested different brain states could be better understood in terms of waves. Active states of consciousness show high frequencies. Sleep states show low frequencies. And in between... Yaffe. Hypnotic states. Theremin checks for eavesdroppers. He peeks outside the rug curtain and returns. If we're overheard, someone might report us. Once I even heard Superintendent Korsunsky just outside. Just calm down. They say he's an eavesdropper, and the last man reported to Superintendent Korsunsky for speaking about people like the doctor from Vienna disappeared. Uh, are these rumors true? I, I'm, I'm afraid both are true. Theremin grabs a handheld item and paces about the lab, paranoid, waving it about. What are you doing? 
trying to make sure there are no active listening devices. Lev, Lev, you, you've got to understand. Then it's also true that Superintendent Korsunsky has the power to fire us. Or worse, he could send us to a special design bureau. I, I know the euphemism, I know. And they're in sunny Siberia. Engineers and scientists in forced labor. Re-education. There are ways that people are still managing to do important work, despite Superintendent Kosunsky and all the rules of the new order. Aren't the rules designed to bring order? We can't let our own systems get the better of us. Do you understand? It's essential. Uh, people need to have the courage to do the work, to, to push the frontiers of knowledge, to help each other, despite the risks. Silence descends as Theremin makes one last sweep. Lev, the research I'm talking about, it, it's too important. We can't ignore this. But I can't ignore this, can I? A delay and improper protocol uh, could bring unwanted uh, attention. Oh, okay, you're responsible, I, I know. But you're so much more. I don't want to reflect poorly on you for bringing me here. Allow me to worry about that. And observe, I'm not. Your proximity alarm issue, it does seem connected somehow. Could the sensitivity tell us something about how the human body fits into the nervous system disorder theories? Hypothesis. Maybe we have a capacitor effect on the equipment, somehow absorbing and discharging the energy. Human capacitor. Well, we can already measure the radiation in the electromagnetic field, but, but it's much more difficult to prove the harm it causes to the human body. Maybe this interference issue is a key. If this work could prove to the new order that exposure to high levels of electromagnetism leads to nervous system disorders? We might be able to get some proper regulations in place for when it's used. Now this is interference. Now I have to notify the Parts Requisition Department of the delay. We're at an institute for scientific research and development, not, not a factory. Your proximity alarm may even give us clues about how the doctor from Vienna allegedly was able to heal people. And that might give us insights into what's happening, not only with you, but others, too. Is it suggesting how the human nervous system communicates? Maybe. Yes. Now you're onto something. Hypothesis. Perception of our world travels in, in waves through our bodies. Heat touches the nerves of our fingertips. Sound waves vibrate inside our ears. <sighs> now for the documentation department. It's back and forth. There must be a vice versa quality. The brain also must emit waves as it receives them. The brain then can be understood as part of a wave-like system. Operating at different frequencies, yes? Yes, yes! Our colleague today already said something like these brainwaves have been recorded in animals. It's reasonable to assume humans emit them too. Maybe those waves somehow relate to the theories of the doctor from Vienna. He practiced hypnosis, strictly forbidden. Doesn't that mean with any involvement we could disappear? We could experiment with the idea. Without revealing, it is based on the forbidden work of exiled scientists. We could even design a project in line with the objectives of the New Order. I know we could. That means the appearance of what we would be doing would not match the reality. <laughs> like so many things in research we do. I'd do anything to work with you, Yafi. But please... Don't ask this of me. This project might enlighten us in our understanding of electromagnetism, which would help your work. And, 
and it, it let radiation, which would help mine, and it might help us better understand your injury, you know, maybe even lead to a cure. The, the risk is... <laughs> is it possible for you to be happy when your injury makes it impossible for you to be touched? I must be happy. I am in an environment where it is against regulations to be unhappy. <laughs> I'm sure there's a form to report on happiness. And it would be delivered to a happiness institute, which doesn't exist. If I don't complete the proximity alarm, the new order could expel me from the institute. Onto the streets. <laughs> Our beloved city, so wounded it. Not much better than a battlefield these days. Struggling to survive. I imagine you read between the lines of regular bureaucratic status reports. There's no wood left for the coffins because people are burning it for fuel and burying the dead in mass graves. Receipts now for the previous form. Yafi, a project like the one you're suggesting would require at least 150 forms to secure authorization. And more interference. Coming in waves. I don't know if I have the capacity. <laughs> I'm confident that you could discharge your energy effectively. Think of it like when you play the cello. That was a long time ago. This is not the place for music. Oh, one more thought. <laughs> Only one. <laughs> Humor me. I'm funny that way. Something you said, it, it connects, again, a, a pattern, a model for her experiment suggesting... I'll write it down. As Ziafi writes, Golovinov enters, a young woman wearing a neck scarf and insignia of the staff of the Institute. But they do not notice her because of buzzer sounds announcing new forms arriving every 30 seconds. Theremin, distracted by the forms, reads Ziafi's note and unintentionally blurts out the name. Mesmer? Again? Uh, forgive me, but Yafi, have you lost all common sense? Yes, he used music in his therapy, a, a kind of interference. But to model anything after him, even to bring up his name, it's a death sentence. <laughs> Good morning, Miss Galavanov. What can we do for you? I apologize for the intrusion. I knocked, but... Apparently not loudly enough. How long have you been standing there? May I help you with those forms? Yes. Please. Lev, they're clearly driving you mad. And Ms. Golovinov is excellent at, at working through the bureaucratic mess of the new order. No, the bureaucracy is beautiful. As she continues, she adroitly walks Theremin through completing and sending off the forms. The bureaucracy brings order to the chaos that would exist without it. Anyone with a strong understanding of how it works can get resources and approval for projects that might make a difference in the world. Point taken. Even projects initially viewed as questionable. Comrade Theremin, we've finished this round of replies. Now you should not receive any more forms as long as the request for the delay is approved, and I expect it will be. Thank you. You're welcome. I, uh, it's nice to, I admire the bold color of your scarf. Thank you. I admit, it reminds me of someone. Um. You may go. Uh, Miss Golovinov, uh, you shouldn't leave just yet. Uh, I think you would be helpful with other matters. May I ask what other matters you mean? My work with your forms just now was useful to you, yes? Yes. I always find it helpful to learn new things, too. And in fact, I enjoy learning about the new technologies being developed at the Institute. It is always good to be well informed. 
I would be happy to tend to the form your work requires of you on your behalf, so you can have more time for your work if possibly I might watch you work and learn from you. Oh, I see. <laughs> I'm flattered, Miss Galavina, but it Lev, is... Lev, you should take up her offer. I've been allowing her to take notes while I investigate the effects of different kinds of radiation on the human nervous system. I see. It's been extremely useful, keeping me organized, better documenting my process, and giving me more time to focus on the work instead of on the paperwork. I appreciate the suggestion, uh, but I don't need any more help now. Thank you again, Miss Golovinov, for your time. May I tell them? I don't know. Do you think that's... What is this? I trust him with my life. I've known him for years. Golovinov checks the hallway and ensures the curtain is closed tightly. All right. Colleague I mentioned earlier. It's her. She is the one I've been consulting about our research. Miss Golovina. Uh, she has also been bringing me copies of the clinical records of patients at the Medical Institute who are diagnosed with nervous system disorders suspected to be caused by radiation exposure. I have only participated in this questionable behavior. In a desperate need to try and find a way to help patients, I volunteer at a hospital. You understand the kind of suffering that patients with nervous disorders experience. Yes. You have one yourself. I, you, Lev, I don't know. Do you see why? Even though I find what you're doing admirable, it's not something Superintendent Korsunsky would approve. You could be fired for it. I wish you hadn't told me. A moment ago before you saw me, I admit I heard you mention Mesmer. You misheard. We are dutiful to the Institute and would never break the rules. I don't believe she misheard us. You misunderstood then. I didn't. It's understandable. Your administrative staff, not a scientist. I know of him and his work. How? She doesn't just volunteer. She does rounds as a nurse. Uh, she was a field nurse in the war. She sees patients firsthand. Yes. So many afflictions wrought by our war technology advancing faster than we can cope. Shell shock. Amnesia. The phantom limb sensations of amputees. She wants to understand, Liv. I discovered Mesmer recently while researching whether ailments we classify as nervous system disorders could be caused by something other than radiation. Another cause. By multiple accounts, he cured a blind woman by manipulating her magnetic fluid. It suggests her blindness was not caused by a physical condition, not caused by radiation, but caused by her mind. Uh, Miss Glavinov, uh, we'd, we'd like a word. Please wait a moment. She works for Superintendent Korsunsky. She could be trying to entrap you by encouraging you to take copies of personal medical records. Or trying to entrap us both by getting us to participate in forbidden practices. That is not true. She's been nothing but dedicated. She could even help us as we embark on our experiment with, with the brainwaves, testing our hypothesis to, to see if they connect to Mesmer. And she can help with the appearances. Forgive me, comrades, I can't help but hear. Yes. Oh, do let me participate. I can ensure a proper documentation trail is made for all of our actions, more than enough to defend us if we were ever accused of any wrongdoing. You're a liar. That isn't possible. Oh, but it is. Together, if we were to recreate Mesmer's work to test if it is actually a cure for nervous system disorders, I could use Form 784 protocol and frame the project in terms that would make it appear to be an electromagnetic experiment. D but... The experiment would be to solve any issues delaying your proximity alarm. Don't you see? That would avoid any official mention of Mesmer. At that moment, Korzynski is heard clearing his throat. 
Everyone freezes. Korsunsky rips down the carpet over the entry. End of scene. The Disastrous Dr. Bonk and His Panicked Patient. Book, lyrics, and music by Zella Selvoy Devan. Scene one, a messy psychologist's office with a desk, chair, and couch. There are stacked boxes all around full of psychology books and Winnie the Pooh stuffed animals. The boxes are labeled to Dr. Henry Bonk from Dr. Francis Bonk. There are toys too large for the boxes scattered around the room, like an inflated punch-a-clown doll. At rise, the office appears empty. Patty approaches the office, then stops just before the door. Okay, okay, I've got this. Do I got this? Don't think that way, it'll all be fine. Oh, but will it? Of course I had to make this appointment on a Monday. Mondays never go well. I can do this. I can do this. Can I do this? Don't think that way. It'll all be fine. <laughs> Come on, Mondays. Give me your best shot. <laughs> Is the doctor going to hate me? No, of, co of course not. <laughs> they already hate me. I'm going to go in there and they're going to see me and run away. What if they see me run away, run smack into a wall and die? <laughs> Wait, no, jeez, Louise, what am I thinking? Oh, holy guacamole, I'm doing it again. No one's gonna run away from me. <laughs> that won't happen. Deep breaths. Patty enters the psychologist's office. Hi, I'm so sorry I'm late. I, uh, hello? Is anyone there? The boxes move. I, <gasps> Oh, yeah. oh <laughs> hello, I'm Dr. Bonk. Uh, that's B to the O to the N to the K, and then add a doctorate. <laughs> oh, yeah, hi. <laughs> Something seems W to the R to the O to the N to the G. Come, come, sit down, oh, sit down. Okay, <laughs> should I? He guides her to the couch, then finds a box on it. Um, let's just get this silly thing out of the way. Dr. Bonk goes to pick up the box, but as he lifts it up, the bottom falls out. Winnie the Pooh stuffed animals fall from it. Uh, is, is something wrong? Would you like me to pick those up? Oh, oh, oh no, no, no. <laughs> uh, no need. Uh, I can pick up a couple of stuffed animals. <laughs> Why couldn't I? Uh, uh, they're too heavy. Ah, that would be silly. Uh, stuffed animals, stuffed with lead. <laughs> yes, it's, it's very silly to be unable to pick up stuffed animals. Let's just leave them there. You know, maybe I should just go and- Sit! Dr. Bonk sits Patty down on the couch. Or I could just sit. Help. Dr. Bonk grabs a pile of paperwork from his desk, then sits on his chair across from the couch. So, uh, looking at your paperwork... You sure do have a lot of boxes, uh, around. I sure do. Are the boxes just, like, your choice of decor? Well, when I left Friday night, they were just seedlings, but I came back this morning and, poof, they had all grown into big old boxes overnight. What? Yeah, just a little bit of... Monkey business. <laughs> okay. I'd be better off taking my business to monkeys. Dr. Bonk fumbles with his paperwork and drops it to the floor. Oh, shucks. Silly me. <laughs> you, you look like you have quite the mess to deal with. And I, I think I'll just, I'll just let you. And we can meet another day instead. <laughs> like February 31st. No! No, 
No, there is no reason for you to leave. I apologize for the rough start. Yeah, I, I get it. Mondays are hard. So we'll meet next week on Tuesday. I hate Mondays. Ugh, me too. Mondays are just so crazy cuckoo, buckaroo. I'm two pep talks in before I can even start the day. Some days I just want to, I just want to. He grabs the punch of clown and puts it in front of him. Bam, bang, bonk Mondays, you know? Yeah, I do. Aren't Mondays just the worst? I mean... Aren't Mondays cruel and dumb? I guess. Don't you feel pummeled by them I... like a boxer in a ring? And I'm losing. They spit lava in our eyes. That's so unfair. Just as the starting bell rings, then it's a punch, a punch, a punch, a punch. To wear black, blue, and green. When I say take down, you say Mondays take down. Mondays take down. Mondays. When I say let's punch, you say Mondays let's punch. Mondays let's punch. Oh, I, I can't. Let's do it. punch. I, I, nobody deserves to get punched. And nobody likes getting punched either. I don't want to be the person that punched Mondays, and Mondays just hates for it. Mondays deserve it. Aren't Mondays just the Aren't worst? Mondays just the they worst. just tear me they apart. Just tear me Rip apart. out and feast on Rip your heart like a fighter on, heart, on the like street. The they take streets. you down every they time. You down every They're time. the only one you can't beat. So give, give them a punch, a punch, a punch, a punch. punch, a punch. Till, they're till they're dead, dead on, on the concrete. concrete. When I say take down, you say Mondays take down. Mondays. Take down. Mondays. When I say let's punch, you say Mondays, let's punch, Mondays, let's punch. Mondays, 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 Mondays. Good job, corn of the cob. Dr. Bunk reaches up for a high five, which Patty returns giggly. How is it that this madman is the first to get me? You know what we should do, Buckaroo? Take down this Monday from the inside. Let's start it all again, but this time, nice and proper. <clears throat> Hello, how do you do, miss? I am Dr. Henry Bonk. It's a pleasure to meet you, Dr. Bonk. Would you care to sit down? Ha <laughs> ha Mondays can't get the best of me and you. Anywho, so uh, now I have your paperwork, June. June. I see you're here for court mandated anger management training. I, uh, my my name is Patty. <laughs> he might get me, but he's still a madman. Your name's Patty? Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I have to go now. No, 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 no. Patty, yes. Uh, I, I found it. I, I, I've got it. Um, Patty, Patty, Patty Piper. Piper Patty. Patty Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers. <laughs> you, pepper picker, are here for uh, an inability to say no. Yeah, that's, that's me. <laughs> because if I could say no, I would have left by now. Well, that's great. I'm actually a specialist in this area. Really? I know that. That is why I made this appointment. Darn tootin'. There's patterns to these things. Patterns you think you see in me? He can't even get my name right. There's the self-hating doormats and sacrificing lab rats. And there's the brave future leaders and sad bottom feeders. And I am neither. <laughs> There's those who know what they are and those who haven't got that far. And I am somehow both. There's those who love all. Which I am. And those who love themselves. Which I'm not. But 
particularly pleasant people and they can't stop. Do you relate? I do. First job was rather scary, hardworking secretary, and no appointment come on in the door. I opened with a grin. Second job, not much later, working as a shy waiter, took their orders, and I lied about an offer of free signs. But to be fair, the kitchen was weird about sides, so right up next job number three, which I'm at risk of losing. I cannot give out full refunds, but I have been for everyone. I only want to belong. Of all things, how is that wrong? But I fear it's breaking me, the strange need for helping. I have people pleasing tendencies. Others will be the end of me. I give them all my time. Don't know where to draw the line. I'm a people person persevering purposely, trying to please particularly pleasant people, probably to preemptively pacify poignant problems that could potentially result in others leaving. I can't stop. Now I wonder what to do. I know what's wrong now thanks to you. A problem it still is without an easy fix. I could just run away a peopleless world. Hooray, but that seems rather lonely to be the one and only. I could stay, let it go on, please everybody and their mom. But then get nothing done. Maybe I should just run. I guess I'm torn between the two. I guess I don't know what to do. Run away or stay right here. Two options that fill me with fear. I'm in a people-pleasing paradox. I'm Schrodinger's cat dead in its box. Please help me defuse this bomb before I end up living with my... I can't do it. I can't live with my mother again. Why would you? I don't live with my mother. I haven't in years. Are you okay? Darn, Tootin. So, first of all, we got to discover the root of your people-pleasing tendencies. These kinds of things don't just pop up overnight. You got to water it and fertilize it. Fertilizer is very important. But what? <laughs> right, right. Sorry, got to stay on track. For a train without a track is lost off the track and wandering, wandering. <clears throat> right. <clears throat> so what do you think started this? Oh, I, I don't know. Genetically, I wasn't dealt the best hand. Well, not the worst, but not the best. M mental health-wise, I mean. No, no, I mean, why do you think you developed this coping mechanism? What? I don't think anything. That doesn't make any sense. Why would I do this to myself? We all live in this battlefield called life. And in that endless galaxy, that is your shield and, and your telescope and, and your life jacket. I, w uh, yeah, but if I cost this myself, then why can't I stop? Well, think of it like allergies. <laughs> you can't help it. Some people shouldn't be legally allowed to make metaphors. This isn't, I can't eat the shellfish at the wedding buffet. It's more, if I don't stop this, I'm gonna lose my job and have to live with my mom, which in case you forgot, I cannot do. Well, let's jump back on track. From shellfish to selfish. Now tell me, why can't you be selfish? You, you think I'm selfish? He thinks I'm selfish. I, I'm not selfish. I, I was a really well-liked kid. Once I got to kindergarten, everybody wanted to be my friend. Mm. But nothing that bad has ever happened to me. I mean, I was a lonely kid, but that was mainly an issue of convenience. There was no one around to be my friend. <laughs> I, I, well, there were a few neighborhood girls my age, but they didn't really want to hang out with me. But they started to hang out with me more once we all started class together. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I was, I was older, and so I was a bit more understanding of people's emotions. I was just more... Oh, I was a bit more people-pleasing. So, you think the pressure of friend-making squashed you into a paper-thin 
people pleaser? Uh, it may be. Actually, well, but before I started school, something big happened. Well, color me intrigued. Patty grabs the Tigger stuffed animal on the floor. My dad left. Yeah, I was, I was too much for him and he just left. Well, isn't that, isn't that just very unfortunate? I was watching, um, I was watching a show or a movie or something starring Tigger. He was my favorite Winnie the Pooh character. I never saw the end of it though. When my dad left halfway through and he, he just never came back. <laughs> I see. Did I break him? I, um, uh, are you okay? <laughs> Tissues, tissues, please. Uh, yes, yes, of course. They're on my desk, they're, they're on my desk. Patty goes to Dr. Bonk's messy desks and searches through it, grabs the box of tissues beneath a funeral program and gives them to Dr. Bonk while still holding the funeral program. Dr. Bonk notices the program in Patty's hand and takes it. Now, yeah. I gotta confess, I made this mess. Me, not the ecosystem. Oh. I got a big bunch of old boxes and a bundle of big old toys from, from. Dr. Francis Bonk, was, was he your brother? <laughs> Father? Oh. Enough of this, Buckaroo. It's high time we get back to you. You sure? This program says the funeral was yesterday. Maybe you should be with family. Oh, shush. Lose the fuss. Family's family. Work is work. I, I just need to work. Work, work, and, and we need to work on you. Oh, okay. Can we not? So your father left, um, and uh, he left while you were watching uh, something involving Tigger, family favorite. Uh, you know, my dad used to pretend to be Kanga. I was his Rue. And it was, he was great. Was your dad great? I, um, I, was he? It doesn't, doesn't matter. They're, they're gone now. Whoop. Gone forever. Um. Because, you know, you can't have a rule without Kanga. Kangaless rule might feel alone, abandoned. Was your father Kanga? I. Who? Eeyore? No, I... Or was he Tigger? Who bounced, bounced, bounced away! Ouch. It's easy to feel abandoned. Do you? Do you? It, it's very common to feel abandoned after losing someone as important as your dad. Sometimes the feeling is so big and vast you think it will swallow you whole only leaving behind no body to be buried or, or cremated or you know whatever whatever you prefer I, it helps to talk about it can we not uh yeah you're, you're you're right we should talk about it but with our families um thank you this session has been very eye-opening um i should be going now then do do you guys validate parking you want to go we'll be all on our lonesome of course not we'll be with our families oh. um, 
Plus, I do everything I wish I didn't. Would you like to talk about it with me? Well, if it would help you. Of course. Help. Would you mind if I sit on the couch? Um, I... Dr. Bunk sits on the couch. Hey, it might work best if, if you sit in my chair. Yeah, no, no problem. <laughs> Patty sits down in Dr. Bunk's chair. Problem. End of scene. Awesome. Thank you. How entertaining. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for watching. So, uh, this is uh, Graham and Judy and Scott. We watched it. Hi, and, Zella. Uh, we Loved enjoyed it. all of it, but we particularly enjoyed yours. <laughs> <laughs> and, this is, and this is Grammy, Deborah, and Steve and Susie. And we loved all of them, but guys, Zella's was the best. <laughs> Those <laughs> songs were wonderful, Bella. Your songs were wonderful. Yes, I love the music. Oh, that was terrific, yes. Sorry, guys, I filled my the audience with my own personal for hire cheerleaders, so. <laughs> <laughs> you, the songs you were wonderful. Them, you have to pay them off next week. Yeah, when you get on the down them. low. <laughs> yeah. I love your red hair. Thank you. It looks great. <laughs> All right, audience members, what was some of the best parts of the show for you? Oh, you know what you're going to hear. I think Zella's song was yeah. uh, about Monday or whatever it was. Uh, that was a wonderful one. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you And you guys, if you're not, uh, for those of you who may not want to speak up, you can just insert things in the chat as well. What was some of your favorite uh, moments in Miho. We had a comment from Julie Bolchunas about how she appreciated the personal approach to dealing with addiction. She said specifically, thank you for the vulnerability Miho. Father character was portrayed impeccably. I would agree with that. What, what did you feel, Jonathan? I love the music in Miho. Oh, sorry. No, that was in Zelda. <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, I, I agree. I, I really enjoyed working with the cast and the crew with that. Um, shout out to everybody who's uh, spending the time to be here on, on a Saturday night and uh, enjoy and watch that performance. Um, yeah, I, I spent a lot of time working on that piece. And, and so it's really nice to see that showcase uh, this weekend. We have another comment here from Ryan Rustwood who laughed his butt off when with the uh, do you validate parking line. <laughs> <laughs> I love that line. Too. I, so this is one of the grandmas, but I have to say all three plays were fabulous. Really enjoyed them. You pulled us in, you engaged us. 
I like the subject matter and I want to see the end of all of them. So when will that happen? That is a good question. <laughs> but that is our work for next year is to really develop the, 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 the whole scripts and hopefully present them in readings within the next 18 months. And that is the goal. What, how do you guys feel, playwrights, about the process of going from cre the create process of story development and into the development of your scripts? Because I think for many of our audience members, that may be a completely new process for them. Would you guys like to describe how you're tackling all that? Go ahead, Brad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's always such a wonderful uh, thing to work with with actors and, and hear the words come to life and and uh in this latest uh, you know preparation for the showcase to um to make refinements with what we were presenting um uh it's it's just an amazing um sneak preview if you will for uh, the development process um and yeah it's uh there's so many aspects to that that i think are um, eye opening and ear opening, if that's a <laughs> proper way to put that. Um, I, I can't thank the actors and directors and CG Guerin, our producing artistic director, uh, enough for kind of shepherding us through this process. And I feel like me in particular, because of um, a tendency, I have to go all over the map with ideas and um, how important it is to pick a lane, as it were, and uh, so that's that's maybe a little a little too much, but hopefully that that gives you a sense of where I was at. Um, CG, we got a, a question from the chat. Uh, I'm curious as to what inspiration was for each of your plays. Was there a moment that it hit you, or is it a longer process? Jonathan, you want to start off with that one? Yeah, for sure. Um, the the moment that it hit me was, I would say, in 2015, 14. Um, I saw A Long Day's Journey Into Night uh, at the uh, Royal Shakespeare uh, Festival. Uh, or not, it's not Royal, the Oregon Shakespeare Festival in uh, Ashland, Oregon. And I love that play. In fact, uh, my graduate studies, one of my focuses was Eugene O'Neill. And uh, I love his, the way he portrays family dysfunction and family dynamics and addiction. And uh, I had this uh, inkling to do something similar to that because that play was written so long ago. And I thought it would just be so important to write something like that. So I took what was uh, already kind of based upon um, my family and, and my heritage and also like the culture that I grew up in and that's where I started about, I'd say five years ago. Um, and I wrote it and uh, it was nice because I got into, in, in, into working with CG and Northwest Theater Workshop and then we refined it and it's, it's just been a long going process. And um, just to kind of circle back to that first primary question that CG asked, which was, you know, what, how, like the process of how it goes, um, I really enjoy this process because we kind of we kind of take it piece by piece, and uh, we're showcasing right now the 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 whole play. I would say is is uh, up to completion, but I, I really enjoy this process to where we get to showcase uh, bits and pieces because I get to still hear what's working and what I'd like to tweak, uh, along with hearing audience feedback and things like that. And this is just all part of the process. But in the end goal. Uh, is to deliver you, to, to you, the audience, a story um, that resonates not just because of my culture and heritage, but, you know, across across all things. Um, and so that's my purpose for being a storyteller. And that's just, this is just part of the process and what I'm willing to do for it. So uh, I hope that answers that question. Beautiful. Thank you. Zella, what about you? Um, for me, this entire play is based off a really anxious joke I made right before my first therapy session that made me think that would be a funny musical. Someone should write that. So then um, I wrote it. I mean, the process to get to this point 
was much longer and much harder than the process to get to that joke, but that was the inspiration for this play. That's beautiful. There's Jonathan. You lost him for a second. I think we have. I was drinking water. I didn't want to interrupt. <laughs> <laughs> just privately. All right, audience, do you have any other questions for the Yeah, players? we got one from Alicia. Uh, intriguing point of inspiration, Jonathan, with Long Day's Journey into Night in Mind, I'm more curious to know about your title, Miho. Reminds me a bit of Mojada from, uh, from Medea and Oedipus El Roy from Oedipus Rex, both modern adaptations of classics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think it's uh, Luis Alfaro who did those interpretations and that's kind of similar to what I was going for. Um, yeah, absolutely. Kind of like my uh, my spin on, on what American classics uh, were back in the day. That's pretty cool. So Brad, I'm interested in how you came up with your idea because it it's very complex, but you know, even if you don't understand the science, what they're talking about, when they talk about it, it makes perfect sense. So you come up with that. Oh, thank you. I, um, in my case, it's been quite a long process and different um, kind of variations on these themes a little bit. Um, but uh, I would say part of the inspiration came from having witnessed some hypnosis quite some time ago and uh, other deep seated interests in uh, the, this time and how so many of these amazing ideas this time in, in terms of um, science were coming together, I leaned into that a bit more with this draft, uh, certainly, and, and um, part of the um, uh, trying to articulate the world in which these that these folks are inhabiting. Um, yeah, boy, I could go on and on. But but suffice it to say a lot of uh, a lot of I, I will say, maybe one other inspiration, um, the, the character of Theremin, who is working with uh, well, some of what he is attributed for what he created uh, reminds me quite a bit of my brother who um, happens to invent uh, musical instruments um, and play them for a living. Um, so I mentioned this because two sisters are in the audience and they know this fellow too, Thomas Truax. So anyway, a combination of inspirations. There was a comment earlier in the uh, chat, Brad, specifically about how your play seems pretty relevant and topical to what's happening nowadays. Um, I'm curious, I know personally that this has been a process, and I'm curious if modern day events are showing up in your writing just naturally, or if it's an intentional parallel that you're finding. That's a great question. I. Um... I think oh. as long as I've been working on this, the um, contemporary issues um, are kind of uh, present in 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 the writing, and um, but it's it's amazing uh, some of these features of even earlier drafts that um, were yeah uh, coming forth again really strongly uh, for me some of the. Some of the difficulties that were happening in Russia in 1920 um, uh, and isolation and things like that that happen throughout time in pretty significant ways. Um, so, yeah, I think um, in every in every sweep with this, there's there's definitely a mind a mindful quality for me about what's happening right here and now the relevance to uh, what's happening politically and and yeah <laughs> sorry no that's that it's it's lovely to know that it's a little bit both like that you're keeping like the it's intentional and mindful but also that it's just kind of showing up as well yes yes both is probably the most succinct way of, of <laughs> 
Well said. I'm also getting from Rob Berkus, uh, Becker, sorry. And I really need to see the completed Dr. Bonk. It's genius. <laughs> Me too. It's, it is genius. It is genius. I love the role reversal going on and all of the uh, talking with actor David Loftus a little bit just about those emotional somersaults. He's like, oh, yeah, she's putting me through the ringer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They're fun to write. Dr. Bonk's probably I like writing Patty a lot because she's she's a lot like me where she has a, log a logical way to get to an illogical conclusion, just kind of downward spirals. But Dr. Bunk's, Bunk's fine, fun to write. I have to go to Rhyme Zone a lot to find good lines for him. <laughs> rhyme Zone is writing your play? Yeah, sorry. I have to give credit where credit is due. <laughs> They're writing my songs, too, if I'm being completely honest. <laughs> awesome. We have uh, from How Logan, Brad, as a musician, I was intrigued by the connection to human capacitance and the musical instrument Theremin invented. Thank you for the elucidation. Oh, thank, thank you. Me. Appreciate that, Hal. And thank you for all of your work with this production. Um, oh, up. yeah. Major shout out to Hal. Yeah. NCG, you're you, muted. You you too, definitely. Uh, Kate and Hal and CG for you know all the work. That, there's so many people that I want to give a shout out to. Um, my director, you know Eric, Michelle, uh, the director for Spellbinders, and uh, CG for or Dr. Bonk. Um, it was just really awesome to work collaboratively together. And uh, yeah, I, I really appreciate it. And uh, Kate and Ed uh, for mm. really putting all this together. It's Absolutely, a, yeah. Mad respect, so thank you. Work behind the scenes. I think, do we have one more, Kate? I think oh, uh, Andy, Andres Acala just stepped in with just a comment as an actor in Miho. I was fascinated by the script first. Always have to read before I get involved. Intrigued by the mystery of only known what is before me. The first pages, the authenticity of, of their background, themes of failed dreams and or perhaps plotting dreams, and the words chosen that these characters have to say through each own struggle through each own struggle is written so well. It causes me to reflect on my own life with these themes and have a desire to want to continue in helping and supporting Henry's journey and why as an actor, it is easy to understand. That's uh, wonderful. No joke. <laughs> it's so funny. I hope you're blushing. We, <laughs> <laughs> the, yesterday for rehearsal, we were, I, they wanted to know more about the script and I, I chose to like, just kind of pepper in what's gonna, what's to come. And, uh, but for the whole time, uh, they have just been working off of the, the what I brought them. So, uh, all three of them, all three of the actors are uh, really. Uh, I commend them for for the work because I know they wanted to know more. And as an actor myself, there's always a part of me that wants to know how did it come to here. Uh, but I I thought it would help me as a writer to go with what we have here. So, uh, I intentionally <laughs> caused pain. Uh, <laughs> and uh you know muted that feeling of like well what i need to know more uh and only until yesterday i kind of like told them a little bit more of the plot which made a lot more sense to them and um i think is what gave you that performance you witnessed tonight so uh andreas and uh matthew and sophia I, you know again i really appreciate you for being patient with me as i put you through this um i thought what you were portraying was uh pretty uh, very very um close to home and i, I was receiving text messages because my my family and friends are watching this and they were they were definitely feeling uh feeling the emotions that you were portraying so thank you uh thank you all so does anybody want to pepper us with what what's going to happen next in any of their plays oh should we save it for when we do the full production cg yeah, yeah, we no just comment. want to tempt you all to come back. You can you, you can go sign up for our newsletter and as as they move their way down the road of developing their scripts, there will be other opportunities to hear the full lengths. We usually do an, unre an unrehearsed reading pretty early on that anyone can attend. And we also um, then do a, a later 
you know, script in hand performance, just testing the piece as we go. So there is wonderful opportunities to come join us and see the full length works. Does that sound good and tempting? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we appreciate the interest very much. Thank you. And we are hoping that that will be live. We would, we love, the one thing we do love about Zoom is that it does allow us to reach from Canada and, you know, England and all across the yeah, US. Tucson in the house. <laughs> yeah, and so we're not quite sure how we can keep, keep that connection going when we go back live, but we are, that is one of our priorities to figure out how to do, because it's just, it's really wonderful for, you know, just to have that reach and for artists to have, you know, friends, family and fans be able to see their work from anywhere in the world. All, All right. right. Are we good? We're good. Thank you for coming tonight. I will put the links to how to keep in touch with us uh, in the chat one last time before we go. And I hope to see you in a theater again soon. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Great job, everybody. Austin, Thank you. Thank great you. job. They were great. Donate money. Thank you. Donate. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> fully entertained. That's so great to hear. Thanks for supporting us by coming. Feel free to.